and this is what uh, we were doing in the morning's class that if there are two random variables so the sum of the random variable will of course be a random variable and the pdf of that sum will be given by the convolution in case if the two random variables are independent and this is a very important result and is very useful in predicting the pdfs of the sum of the random variables so just to give you an example those of you who are doing this nuclear physics experiment the counting statistics or otherwise also the gm counter uh, gm counter experiment they have been regularly building uh, this quantity n prime is equal to n minus nb where n is the number of counts which is detected by the gm counter when source is present and nb is the number of count when source is not present so we call that as the background count now of course when we think about this n prime this n prime is the difference of two random variables I mean, the random variables means that this if you repeat the same experiment with all the possible conditions which you keep same still you are going to get of course different result for a given experiment and we already know that both are a poisson distribution i mean n is poisson distributed and nb is poisson distributed so one of the questions i mean even before proceeding is n prime distributed according to poisson distribution or not because what we are talking about it is the difference of the two random variables a priori how can we say whether it is going to be a poisson or not so this question can be understood or answered once you try to figure out for the poisson distribution if there exists let's say x a random variable which is distributed with some parameter lambda 1 and y be another param uh, random variable which is distributed with lambda 2 will x plus y or x minus y be a poisson distributed uh, random variable or not so that is what is the question about this n prime if that is the case then of course you can predict all the things regarding n prime by understanding the relation of the parameter of n prime with that of n and nb so we of course i mean when we conduct an experiment there are so many things which we are learning for the first time that we do not think about it uh, in this way but this is what is happening in that experiment first of all we have to be clear whether this n prime is poisson distributed or not and then only we can decide whether the number of counts will be i mean uh, can be added or subtracted simply and still we consider the poisson distributed or not for example the background just think about the background you may have already seen by this time that the background in the gm counter is coming from several sources cosmic rays walls etc etc i mean there are so many the environment and then the question is all of these sources are different sources if each one of the sources is poisson distributed can we considered the sum of these sources which means the convolution of those random variables be another poisson or not yeah i mean nb itself is a convoluted quantities which may be coming from several random variables each of which is poisson distributed so this is something which is the direct application of your probability and statistics okay so i wanted to start my class by having a simple problem which we must undertake before proceeding further so this is the problem a simple one so we have joint pdf which is given as k times 2x plus y and zero otherwise in this range of course the pdf is given and then we have our regu regular questions so for example find determine this normalization constant k find say expectation value of x variance of x uh okay maybe you can continue to figure out marginal densities p x s and p y y r x and y 
इंडिपेंडेंट एंड देन ओके डू समथिंग लाइक पी एक्स गिवन वाई एक्स ओवर वाई कंडीशनल पीडीएफ सो लेट्स जस्ट ट्राई टू अटेम्प्ट दिस प्रॉब्लम and and see the a real application i mean a working of what we were discussing so how to find k since pdf is given sir we can take the integral from 0 to 1 and 0 to 2 on Absolutely y and put right. it equal to 1 so right let's just do that so this is what we are supposed to do so you just take k or 2x plus y k of course can be taken outside please integrate this a simple integral and let me know what the result is One by four. So, okay. Let yes. me see if others are also getting it. K is equal yes. to one by four. Two of you have said. Uh, is there anybody else? Yes, sir. Person? K is equal to one by four. Okay. K is equal to one by four. So that's it. Is so we have one over four two x plus y as the PDF. Okay. So find let's say e x. So let me put it as one. Find e x expectation value of x. So how do we do that? This is of course simple. So I can put zero to one, zero to two k. Now we have already defined one over x times two x plus y d x d y. so it's a simple integral again you are integrating over y from 0 to 2 you are integrating over x from 0 to 1 so let's just do that So twenty-eight by three. Okay, let me see twenty-eight by three. Seven by twelve. Seven by twelve. Yes, sir. It is seven, seven by twelve. Okay, seven by twelve is the right one. Then, since every one of you are saying so, twenty-eight by three is not wrong. Is the wrong answer? So, I mean, anyway. Uh, you can do it simply. It is two x square plus x y. The whole idea of this class is to ensure that you are able to do some simple integration, so that by the time you reach your examination hall, which means your computers, you should be able to take care of some complicated integrals also. Okay, so let's just do variance. So how will you do variance? Since we already have e x, so let's just use the definition of variance sigma square x. Is equal to e of x square minus e of x whole square, and you have already got this guy seven over twelve. So e of x square. Let's just do that. So x square, x y. Okay. So 
एडिशनल एक्स सो दे विल बी वन स्क्वायर मार्जिनल फास्ट जस्टिफाइड pdf and you can see that this guy should of course integrate to give you one okay what about py y another one so in this case you will be doing x 0 to 1 1 over 4 2 x plus y dx 1 plus y by 4 yes sir 1 plus y by 4 1 plus y over 4 Or one plus y whole entire. No sir. Sir, one by one plus y divided by out of bracket. Okay, I understood. Uh, this is what I have written. Written. I mean, what you said was, I guess, this. So one plus y divided by whole divided by one, four. Yes. And we have yes. to remember that this guy is uh, this one. So now, is this PDF joint PDF corresponding to x and y being independent random variable? R X and Y independent. Uh, no sir. No sir. And they are why not. would you say that? Sir, because P X P Y is not equal to P of X Y. So when P X Y is not equal to P X X times P Y Y, random variables are not independent. And then you can check it for this particular problem, if it's uncorrelated or the correlated one so you will have to of course do in that case expectation value of x expectation value of y and then expectation value of x times y and just check whether they are coming out to be or not okay but let's well, that's okay pretty simple so i would just suggest doing one more which is 
P X given Y. Just to see what kind of thing we are getting here. So this is what? This is. P X Y. Joint PDF. Divide by P Y Y. Marginal PDF. And this will be. Two X plus Y. I mean, now that you have got everything, so it's rather simple. Yeah, two X plus Y divided by one plus Y because one by four is there. So this is the conditional PDF which you are getting. So now, do you think conditional PDF will also obey the law of probability, whether it will be between zero and one? Conditional PDF. Yes, sir, it should. It should. It must. I mean, this is all the things about the conditional probability which you know of. It is called probability because of the reason exactly that it will form, it will follow all the laws of prob probability. So it, that's the reason why it is called PDF. Uh, something about the notation, you will find books in which PMFs are written as PXs and PDFs are written as FXs. Now, the reason I mean, one of the reasons you can think of that you are building probability out of this X by saying that we have X less than K. In this case is FX DX. So somehow it gives uh, an idea that OK, FX is different from probability. So you use the word FX. But then I mean FX is also used as function and function does not necessarily be normalized to one. So it's just the convention that you will find in several books. The PMF written as PX and PDF written as FX. And then in other books you will find both PMF and PDFs. They are written as FX. So as long as you understand that whenever we are talking about a quantity like FX or I mean the one which I am using PX for both PMF and PDF. As long you as you understand that what this PX correspond to, there is no problem in understanding this. But I mean this is something which we uh, must remember that you may find in books that these notations are there. And of course the uh, authors choose one over other because of certain reasons and as I have been saying that PDF is uh, okay not exactly probability so FX DX sounds a reasonable one. And then also for example the notation which I have been using for joint PDF is this one but this notation is very common okay not the fourth one commonly used as simply PXY just to say that it is function of two random variables. Or FXY again to say the function of random variable or FXY. I mean these are just the notations. There is nothing uh, specific about it. Reason why small x's and small y's are used in the arguments instead of capital ones in most of the books because whatever we build ultimately turns out to be a number. This PXY or FX, they are supposed to follow certain rules of the probability and those axioms were that probability has to be between 0 and 1 and summation has to give you 1. Capital X and capital Y, they are called the random variables. And hence they are kind of an abstract quantity. Other, on the other hand, small x and small y are the values which that capital X and capital Y take. So if I go back, for example, on this problem, the reason why we write it in terms of small x and small y, because this small x and small y, is go, they are going to take values. If you write down, I mean, sometimes people think about writing it as k of 2 capital X plus capital Y. 
But then what I am doing here, I am basically trying to add two random variables, which will be another random variable and has it will have its own distribution. So somehow just to uh, avoid having that problem that what we are getting here on the right hand side is actually a number. So when you are going to put a small x some value, a small y some value, you are going to get some number and that number has to be between 0 and 1. That is why the I mean this argument is with small letters x and y, whereas p has those capital X y written as subscripts. But I mean there is nothing wrong in writing it like this as well. It's just that one has to understand. Now you may ask me, sir, when it is so clear that we are using P, X and Y as the random variable. Why to put these two guys? So that the reason is this. If you remember when I was doing the one dimensional random uh, variables and I say, for example, gave you the uniform PDF, uniform random variable PDF. I wrote it as what? X comma A comma B. Where A and B were basically the end points of this. Now suddenly somebody may start thinking these A and B also as the random variable if I do not write for example here X. So this tells me that there exists only one random variable in this distribution and rest of the things are what are these quantities A and B? Parameters. They are called the parameters of the distribution. So I mean, it is just an explicit way of writing whenever you have this, you see this capital X uh, written like this. But as long as it is clear to you what you are doing, I don't think there is any problem with the notation, whatever notation you choose. And unfortunately, probability statistics is such a vast field. It is ranging from maths to statistics to guys in economics, commerce, science, that there is no unified notation which you will find. I mean, you pick a different book and you will find that these are slightly different. Most of them are between these what I have tell you. So it is about PX, FX and things like those. Questions here? Or on what we were doing? Sir, capital X and Y are random variables and small x and Y are successes, right sir? And the values. Now, the values which capital X and capital Y are taking, yes. Yes, so when sir. you are saying a random variable, then it has to take a numerical value which is to be there in the real number, which has to be a real number. Yeah, remember that the definition of the random variable that it is a function which takes you from the sample space to a real number space. So whenever you are talking about, let's say X H is one, then this one is basically small x. And capital X, this is the random variable, which is nothing but a function, right? The function is taking a value one for this uh, argument H. Right, sir. Got it, sir. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, uh, something else which we did in the today's class, and I also wanted to have problem on that, which sir, was the, yes. Sir, in conditional probability, we are saying this will exist in certain limit. Otherwise, p y y will be zero. Then it will create okay. problem in the denominator. Right, so in this case, in this case, you have no issues with X and Y range. Yeah. Yes, the, sir. the range which is given to you. There may be a case, but in that case, the only thing which should not happen. I mean, it is clear from the pro formula that it should not be exactly equal to zero. Right, I mean, this, uh, this is clear from the pro formula. If it is exactly equal to zero, this definition doesn't make any sense. And in simple term, you can say given y, what is the probability of x? And y is a null event. There, there is no nothing as y. Then what is the prob ask, a question of asking about this probability of x given y, right? So uh, I mean, intuitively, uh, having zero in the denominator doesn't make any sense for conditional period. That was true for uh, even when we were discussing about the conditional probabilities that P A given B has this P A intersection B divided by P B and P B cannot be equal to zero. Now that you have asked this question and actually reminded me, so I should also tell you some other interesting thing. Now look at, for example, the definition of expectation value of X. 
Yeah, we write minus in the simple. Let's say one dimension. You can of course extend it this or in discrete variable. So let me be explicit, although it doesn't need to be, but so XK or K, whatever you write. Yeah, these two, I mean the expectation value will exist if and only if in the case of continuous one, your minus infinity to infinity mod X PX DX should be less than infinity that there exists this integral which is finite. And the same thing for this EX which is discrete that the series XK PXK that has to be convergent. Only then you will find some value of expectation value of X. In case if the integral doesn't converge or the summation doesn't converge, then in that case uh, you will find that for those distribution expectation values will be infinity, which means that there is no point of talking about mean. So those are all the things which are of course, I mean whatever is there with the uh, integrals. So when you are talking about the variance, whenever you are talking about the higher order moments, this restriction applies as it is what you have read in the past that integral has to be convergent. There may be certain uh, cases where this integral may not be convergent and hence in those cases on those distribution, EX expectation value of X doesn't even exist. So it's an ill-defined quantity or it is infinity. I mean, you would say otherwise. So sir, do we use such uh, functions uh, in order to define our probability? Yeah, there exist certain functions PX where you will find that expectation value of X and variances of X are uh, infinite. There are, I mean, okay. Okay, sir. it is just that in those cases, the expectation value and the variances won't make much sense. Uh, now, OK, now you have asked it, so you should also try to figure out that. Yeah, but these things, I mean, these are important things. Unfortunately, I mean, within the limited time of the class, we are unable to communicate exactly all the details as you have to finish everything within those nine lectures. But some of these things, of course, do make sense because this is something which you read about the integrals. Remember that we were talking about the square integrable. I mean, that has to be less than infinity for something wave function to be square integrable. And then we also found that in continuous basis like X basis or uh, for our uh, derivative operator, that means the momentum operator, we had this issue that you cannot normalize in the strict sense of normalization. There you are normalizing to delta functions to get some physics out of it. So yeah, I mean, those things are there. Anyway, Something which we read, convolution. Who is going to tell me what was convolution? Convolution. Morning. Uh, whatever you remember, it doesn't matter. I mean, you have to be right. Hmm. So convolution, what we read was this. If so, X, uh, yeah, go ahead. If X okay. and Y are two independent random variables, then the PDF of uh, some Z is equal to X plus Y is given by convolution of X and Y. Excellent answer. Excellent. Uh, this is what I was looking for. So if X and Y are independent random variable, then the PDF of the sum of the independent random variable is given by what we call as the convolution. And I'm just going to do that. You have to remember now for all the times that whenever two random variables are added, it cannot be a simple addition. The resultant will be a random variable. Yeah, so we have uh, this random variable Z and we wrote in the morning. So can somebody remind me? What will be this in terms of, let's say we consider W to be X and Z is equal to X plus Y. Does somebody remember this? So integral uh, of mine from minus infinity to infinity of uh, 
P of X and P of Y, uh, Z minus X. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, this is something which I would suggest that you remember. You will find that this will be useful in variety of cases. Variety of cases. So anyway, let's just use this. It's not that you were uh, mandatorily asked to remember it. It is somehow if you remember it. That's the question. So okay. Now. X and Y are two independent random variable distributed according to exponential distribution. I haven't done in the class the exponential distribution. Well, it's not difficult. Let me just tell you the exponential distribution has one parameter. So let me just write down. Which is lambda exponential minus lambda X. X has to be greater than or equal to zero and lambda has to be greater than zero. Now this lambda which is written in the in front of this exponential minus lambda x so exponential is exponential minus lambda x and this lambda is nothing but a normalization constant and uh, since we have this minus of lambda x you are clear that small x has to be greater than or equal to zero because if x goes to minus infinity this function would have been divergent one so exponential distribution is defined like this and what what is given in the question that there exist two of those both of them are sorry uh, lambda y y greater equal to zero lambda greater than zero so the joint pdf i mean i did not even need to write so uh, let me just use this since they are independent we have pxx that is already given to you what do we have to figure out py z minus x so what would be P Y Z minus X. This is this and this is this just to have the notation being clear. Now what will be P Y Z minus X? So just replacing Y, y Z minus X in exponential. Right, but it will have implication here. See Z minus X has to be greater than or equal to zero. So that means Z has to be greater than or equal to X or maximum value of X, which X can take is, is Z. So now please do this integration P Z Z in order to find it. So what will be this? Tell me the integral limit, which is over X. So X has zero to be greater than equal to zero. zero to Very good. So X has to be greater than zero, but then it has to be less than equal to Z in order to ensure that my P Y Z minus X is a PDF and then put whatever is there. So Lambda E minus Lambda X and Lambda E minus Lambda Z minus X. Please do this integral and give me the result. So I'm sorry, I have to use the same page. But it is just the answer which you have to give me. So lambda square z e to the power minus lambda z. Lambda square z e to power minus lambda z with Z has to be of course greater than or equal to zero. Okay, let me wait for others to give the result. Yes, sir, same. Sir, same. Okay. Sir, same. Okay, good. So now, can you tell me that the convolution of two exponential distribution, is it an exponential distribution? Yes, sir. Yes, no. uh, why? I mean, there is one more Z here, whereas there was no X there. Yeah. Here there was no X, yes. here there was no Y. And then, of course, the corresponding normalization is different. So it's not true. The convolution of two exponential is not an exponential. 
so thinking about convolution of two poison is a poison is not natural i mean uh, not intuitive just to think about it in that direction one has to really do this problem and then figure out whether it is or not and then one can think about the same thing whether the convolution of two normal distribution is that a normal distribution whether the convolution of two uniform distribution is that a uniform if not then what else okay uh, something else which i wanted to ask in my previous class but i forgot although it's very simple but i okay forgot and i still think that it's important so pr theta this is one example which we were doing for 2d transformation of random variable for going from xy to r theta so cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates and the result which we got this was this pr theta is equal to this one and then i also asked you to find out the uh, marginal pdfs which you of course found out and they are also written on the same page can somebody tell me whether the pdf of r theta independent or not so that means whether r and theta are independent random variable or not yes sir they are independent yes sir they are independent and that is absolutely right because you have already seen that r e minus r square over 2 that was the pdf of r 1 over 2 pi was the pdf of theta so we are writing joint pdf as the product of the pdfs and this is the cons i mean the reason why it was because in the original pdf which we were using that x and y they were independent random variable so i mean one can of course make this problem little bit complicated just by having a simple idea that if there are x and y which are correlated and the joint pdf cannot be written as the product of this then what would be the pdf of r theta so one can simply make this a uh, little bit tougher i would say so please do remember the concepts i mean it is the concept which one has to remember all the time once you remember the concept of course things will follow okay any questions on what we have done because i would now switch to something which is very important in the case of probability in fact if you go by the book v balakrishnan this is what we call as the crown jewel of probability others will also write something similar so any questions with what we were doing okay if not now then let me just go ahead with what is called the crown jewel of probability and this is something called central limit theorem we are going to just do the definition of it we are not going to prove it but this definition itself actually takes care of the importance of the central limit theorem i mean the of whole probability thing and you have been using it by the way all the time in your labs it's maybe somebody has heard of it some of you have heard of it and some of you may might not have heard so anybody who has heard of central limit theorem yes sir yes okay uh, where did you hear about this one the crt in that time i take to write down the definition where have you heard about this i mean uh, in case if you have if you can recall sir we did this topic in graduation okay as a topic i mean which to in which subject what was the subject which you were undergoing all of you did that or uh, it is possible that you may not be remembering that is absolutely fine if you are unable to recall it is fine but have you done that in that case it's just that we are going to see the importance thing so okay others i think in stats oh you had a course on statistics huh yes right 
Okay, so I am writing this statement and I will dissect this statement uh, after finishing it off. So, okay, you may have your cup of water while I'm writing it. So distributed random variable, which means I, I, D, R, B. Since we are not going to do the proof, so I'm just trying to write as explicit as possible for this statement. Sigma square. Then the so this is the reason why you have done it in statistics sampling distribution. No, by the way, all of you have used it that I am uh, telling you, and you will come to know of it soon. I see. So I should just. So just making my life a little bit simpler. OK, so this is the statement. Of the central limit theorem. In a minute's time, I will relax the statement a little bit, but at this point of time, let's just read the statement of the central limit theorem. Let X1, X2, X3 to Xn be independent and identically distributed random variable. So even though they are independent and identically distributed, but it is possible that we may not be knowing the PDF of any of those random variables. So all we know is that they are independent and identically distributed, each having finite mu. Now finite mu, remember that I said that certain distributions may have infinite mean, so it won't uh, apply in that case. Each of these random variable will have finite mu and finite variance, sigma square. Then the sampling distribution of the sum of these random variables and the average of these random variables. So sum of these random variables means x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus xn. I'm just going to write soon. And the average is nothing but x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus xn divide by n or it is nothing but sum over n. That will tend to be Gaussian or normal as n tends to infinity. So the this, this is one theorem which gives the maximum importance to Gaussian or normal distribution because of which the Gaussian or normal distribution is so important. Now let's just try to read what we have said and try to understand it again. First, if x1, x2, x3, xn are random variable, then of course if any sum which you are going to make out of it. Then all of these are random variable it's x1, x2, xn and hence Sn will also be a random variable and it will also have some distribution. Since it's a random variable, it will have some distribution. Now xn, which is nothing but the Sn over n, since it is Sn is x1 plus x2 up to xn. So this guy will also be a random variable. So the theorem says that even if we do not know what is the PDF or the PMF of any of these random variable, 
then also we know that the PDF of SN or XN that will surely be Gaussian as n tends to infinity. So that is the importance that without even knowing the PDF of any of these x1 to xn random variable, still we are able to figure out or even we are able to say about the PDF of sn, which is the sum of the random variable, and that of xn, which is the average of the random variable. And we are sure that they are normally distributed. Now, of course, if it is normally distributed, then we should also be knowing what is the sum, what is the mean, and what is the variance of this distribution. So, OK, now I am just going to use average Xn as Xn bar because Xn was already my one of the observ random variable. So I'm using Xn bar as my random variable, which is nothing but the average. So first question with respect to this statement of my theorem. Because this statement itself is very important. You do not know anything about the PDF of original random variable. You just knew that it had finite mean and the variance. And still you are able to make some judgmental claim about the sum or the average. So you are able to say something about the PDF of sum and the averages, even though you do not know the PDF or PMF of any of those random variables. Questions? Sir, when we're saying finite. So what is mean, a... Go ahead, go ahead. So uh, when we're when saying, you're... Yep. saying uh, finite mean and variance, uh, do you mean all those uh, random variables have same mean or they can have different means? Yeah, I mean, in case uh, this is what we are saying right now, they are identical, right? What is identical? Identical means that if one of the random variable has mean this expectation value of X1, E of X1 is mu, then of course expectation value of all of these are mu if they are identically distributed. And I said that I will be relaxing it later on, but okay, at this point of time, yes, they are identically distributed. That means all of these random variables will have their expectation values, which is equal to mu, correct? Identically distributed. What about other? Somebody else was also asking. So I was just asking about the identical distribution part, like uh, what did it actually mean? Oh, identical distribution means that uh, let's say if X1 is binomial distributed, then X2 is also binomial distributed. X3 is also binomial distributed with the same parameters. Xn will be the ones with the same parameters. So it is basically that if I know about X, one, then I know about all of those. They are identical means they are all distributed according to the same distribution with the same parameters. That's what the identical is. Independent will allow me to write any joint PDF in terms of the individual product. Remember, for example, in my problem, which we were doing, uh, where we were trying to find out the X, Y being normal distributed, both were standard normal distributed. So they were identically distributed, right? And then when I said that they are independent, then you are able to write PXY is equal to PXX times PYY. And that's how you wrote one over root two pi exponential minus X square over two, one over root two pi exponential minus Y square over two. So that is what the uh, identical mean. It is coming from the same one. Sir, are you going, going to derive this uh, theorem? Sir? No, I'm not going to, but I am going to say something uh, more, some more important things about this theorem. Yeah, derivation, it's not that it's the derivation which itself is uh, tricky. Derivation is simpler in case if we know certain things about uh, our probability statistics. For example, we haven't done in our class the moment generating functions, the characteristic functions, and they, those life, those guys make our life easier. But we are restricting your labels to certain portion in both the classes, and hence I do not want to go into that because if I try to elongate that probability and statistics again, I mean it's a one semester course in itself in general. So I am not going into that. Okay, so what am I going to say further about this? Now, 
S n which I said is X1 plus X2 plus X n. Can you tell me? I mean, I, I have said that this really uh, goes to Gaussian, but what will be the mean of this? So can we say something about E of S n? So what will be this? This will be expectation value of. Right. And expectation of the sum. Can always be written as. Expectation of the sum E of X plus Y. Expectation of each of like E of X1 plus E of X2. Sums of the expectations, right? E of X1, X2 plus E of Xn, which means this is mu identically distributed and hence all of these are mu. So this is n times mu. And what will be expectation value of that means of this Xn bar? This will be E of Sn over n. This will be where n is a constant mu mu right one mu. over n and mu uh, which is mu the same as the expectation value of any of those random variables right now can we say something about variance of sn also because gaussian distribution are defined by two of those parameters so then we have to think about now x1 plus x2 plus x uh. yes so it will also be the sum of variance because all are independent, so they don't have correlation. Right. So first thing which we need to know that these guys are all independent. Whenever cos x i x j, they are zero for i not equal to j. This is what the independent part is. And hence, sigma square can be simply written as sigma square x1 plus sigma square x2, so on and so forth, sigma square xn. And since they are identically distributed, so sigma square plus sigma square plus sigma square, which means n times sigma square. What will be variance of xn bar? Sorry, variance of xn. What will be this guy? Do you remember? Well, how Must does it escape? N. So this guy scale said one over n square variance of S n. Please uh, go back and check it that how sigma square scales with if x has variance sigma square y is equal to ax plus b we find sigma square y what was that a square sigma x square so this will scale as this and hence it will be sigma square over n so what we have found that means that sn is normally distributed, which is sum with the mean n mu and variance n sigma square and xn bar is normally distributed with mean this sigma square sigma square over n. So this is what the theorem says that even though I did not know anything about the PDF of X1, X2, X3, except for the point that they all had identical mean and they all had identi identical variance. Other than that, we did not know anything about that, but the sum is going to follow normal and X and bar is going to follow this normal. In fact, it is a common practice to convert it into standard normal. Standard normal. How do we find the standard normal? If given a random variable, let's say Sn. Given a random variable Sn, uh, how will we get the standard normal? So Sn minus 
n mu over n sigma square n mu over n sigma square which you will find out is same as writing as n okay i will have to just just a second which is same as writing x n over n minus mu and in the denominator sigma square sigma square right yes no yes sir yes sir right so this is basically writing up to this point zn which is sn minus n mu over n sigma square except for one problem what is that problem there is one problem so this is fine this is the random variable sn is random variable and mu is the mean what comes in the denominator variance or standard deviation when you convert into uh, standard normal so x is standard normal with mu sigma square and i want to convert into z what it is x minus mu divided by sigma square only sigma remember x and mu will have the same unit as sigma then only this will be a dimensionless quantity it cannot become uh, it cannot have sigma square it is the standard deviation which goes in the in this definition of z which means in the first case this should be root n sigma square and what should be here then so root of this and then and then so how to get from this guy this guy i mean this is simple i just did sn minus over n minus mu what will be the denominator divided by n root n divided by n divide by this or you can think about basically what i have written is x n bar minus mu sigma over root n it is one and the same thing so what distributive will, will uh, this standard normal will follow this will follow a normal distribution which is 0 1 yeah so this is a common way of writing so that one does not need to write down the sum and the averages differently but this is a very common way of writing that the standard normal distribution which for the sum sn minus n mu over root n sigma square which for the average is written like this nothing but xn minus mu mu this will follow n01 or you can write them the same thing as when n tends to infinity limit n tends to infinity probability of this zn less than equal to z Minus infinity to z one over root two pi exponential minus z square over two dz, which is basically nothing but writing the CDF of it. So going back on my statement, let me just see what we have done. We have said that we did not know about the PMF or the PMF PDF of x i s, except that we knew that they had the finite mean and the variances. we know that in all those cases sampling distribution of the sum sn and average xn bar will tend towards gaussian or normal as a small n tends to infinity as the this tends to infinity so this statement dissection i will do tomorrow and i will tell you how basically all of you have used this statement in your experiments all of you not uh, in counting statistics experiment but in the exp experiments which you have already performed so i will take that this as the starting point but anyway some questions if you want to ask okay so uh, we will discuss tomorrow morning how what i am saying is that you have used this central limit theorem 
even though you might not have encountered it in your statistics class, I mean, you may not have uh, read it explicitly as that. So we'll do that tomorrow morning from 9 to 10 or oh, 10 to 11. Thank you guys. In that case, I mean, we will uh, try to finish our probability statistics unit uh, soon because, uh, okay, I mean, uh, nine lectures were uh, allocated and we have already gone slightly ahead. I mean, we have uh, reached to almost eighth or ninth lecture here. And we are still left with two more topics. Okay, guys. Thank okay, you, sir. sir. Thank you.